David, a number of you will know David, especially those uh, from the Lincolnshire Network, but also David has, has got a presence uh, throughout the country for, you know, uh, extremely well respected in the careers community. So we're absolutely thrilled to, to, to have uh, you here, David, again for the, for the Complete Careers Conference. I'm not quite sure exactly how many conferences we, we've managed to, to get you to, to join us in for, but um, we're really thrilled to have you, David. So, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Thank you, John. Um, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I'll share mine. And that sounds like a plan. Hopefully we're there. Lovely. Right. So I'm going to do one other change here. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, thanks to Complete Careers for the invitation to join you um, and to present uh, this conference. Um, I can't answer your question, John. I can't remember how co many conferences it is as Complete Careers or Lincolnshire Careers, but uh, I'm always pleased to support the work of Complete Careers um, and particularly all the work you do and above all of that you're just such nice people to work with anyway so um pleased to be here um the this particular uh, talk may end up you may be witnessing my last ever conference speech uh, i've been gradually retiring since the summer of 2018 when i reached pensionable age um uh, but there's been one or two things that are happening that I couldn't let go of, um, particularly, I'll make reference to it in a minute, uh, the careers leader training, which is something I'm really glad to see. I've having banged on about it for long enough that we needed that. Um, but, but I've been gradually retiring since the summer of 2018, and I think all the pandemic has done is just probably going to hasten the final stages of this. Um, I've got one panel session to do for the CDI at their National Careers Leaders Conference next month. Uh, I've got one more CPD session to do online for some careers leaders on the Isle of Wight, and I think that's it, but uh, this could well be the final conference talk. Uh, and I'm going to focus it on, as you can see in the title, careers education in the curriculum. Um, throughout my work uh, as a careers leader, before they were called careers leaders, I think I was called head of careers, uh, and supporting careers leaders in various roles that I've had, um, I've had three main interests in particular. One is the leadership and management of this work in schools, getting that right. I think it's absolutely crucial if you get the right person and the right management arrangements, you can really take this forward. Secondly, is training for this role. Um, it's always seemed to me to be a deep irony that the one person in a school or college who's supposed to be promoting to young people the need for training and qualifications for jobs is the one person who's had no training and qualification for their job as the careers leader. Um, and the third area has been the curriculum bit. Now those first two, I'm pleased to say that the career strategy has addressed. Uh, it is now a requirement that every school has a careers leader. Um, and for the first time ever in this country, certainly in my professional working lifetime, we have nationally available free at the point of delivery training for careers leaders. And I think those are two brilliant um, developments. This third area in these particular set of interests, the area of careers education and curriculum, I am seeing signs that it is getting the attention that it needs to get it back to where we used to be. Uh, but it still needs some further work. So that's what I'm going to explore with you in this session. It's going to focus particularly on careers education in the curriculum. That isn't to say, I need to <coughs> acknowledge, it is not the only key issues still to be addressed in this field in terms of careers work and supporting young people. Um, I, another major area that needs attention, but it's for another day and for another audience, well, not another audience, probably the same audience, but for another speaker, is this whole area of how do we provide appropriate personal career guidance for all young people at the time they need it. Um, after Connections was closed down eight years ago, responsibility was devolved to individual schools and colleges, but unfortunately, none of the money that local authorities and connections spent on the career guidance service was devolved to schools. And the only reason 
that young people have access to career guidance now is because schools have managed to raid other parts of their budgets to provide that support for young people. And I think that's still an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, and it's not just that as well. It's that's really important that schools have the funding to deliver benchmark eight, basically. Can we make sure that each and every young person gets career guidance at the time they need it? We can't do it unless we've got the resource to do it. But there's another important reason as well, which is the current policy assumes that all young people are in a school or college and they're not all in a school or college. And actually, as Rachel mentioned in her talk, we've got an increasing number of young people who are home educated. There were tens of thousands of them before the pandemic. There are more of them now. Where do they go for their career guidance now? That's a serious issue that still needs to be addressed. So I don't want to downplay that. It's just I haven't got time to deal with everything. So on this particular session, I'm going to look at the careers education and curriculum issues. But we do need to pay attention to how do we make available the, the, and hand me up schools meet their statutory requirement to secure access to independent guidance. That's what the law says at times when you need it. OK. Um, and what this talk is, it's a shortened, you'll be relieved to hear, and updated version of the annual lecture I gave at the International Centre for Guidance Studies at Derby University last December uh, when they invited me to give that lecture. Um, but it's updated because there have, some, have been developments um, over the last 10 months since that took place uh, and actually is, I would say, welcome developments as we'll see as we go through. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give you the briefest review of the history of careers education, just so we've got some context um, in which I can explore the current position and what we need to do. Um, I do think we need to learn the lessons of history, not to go back to how things were, but to learn from the past and put those in contemporary, put those lessons in contemporary times. I'm then going to offer you a critical analysis of where we are and then offer some practical proposals for what we need to do in the future if we're going to make sure that each and every young person has access to the sort of careers education programs that you've been talking about throughout this today. So let me start with the history. Uh, it's not going to be a long session, but it is important just to set out the, the history. Uh, it's a history that actually goes back 100 years. I'm not going back that far. Um, I, did, I have produced a book uh, on the history of careers education in schools, a second edition of it we launched last year, um, which does trace it back all those hundred years, but I'm only going to go back 60 years or so, because that's the point at which we started to see careers education as we currently recognise it in school curricula. Um, it was the time when those of you who've done your guidance training will be aware of the work of Donald Super, Ginsberg, Peter Dawes, um, who introduced the concept that actually career choice, occupational choice, is not just an event. It's a developmental process over time. Up until that point, that wasn't something that was recognised. And in the early part of the 20th century, career guidance was simply one off interviews that it was assumed you could do at any point in time, match people to what was most appropriate for them and hope they moved into it. And we've learned since that it's a developmental process over time. So it's something which can be <coughs> worked on. And therefore there is a place for careers education in the curriculum, not just individual guidance interviews as important as they are. So that's the starting point for careers education. Up until that point, all that happened that you would recognise as careers education was information talks, possibly in assembly, occasionally in classrooms, and maybe some sessions on how to complete an application form. But that was the limit of careers education up until the 1960s. And it was in the 60s that careers education started to appear on school timetables, but not for all pupils and not in every year. So it was something that was seen that was done in the latter years of education in secondary schools and largely for those who were not going to continue on into the sixth form and certainly not for those who were going to continue into university. <coughs> the big growth came in the 70s. Um, one of the early publications from the uh, education department about careers education recognised that careers education is that element of a secondary school's curriculum that is explicitly concerned with preparing young people for ad adult work in life. 
And I think the second point they make is an interesting one, is that saying that between the ages of 13 and 17, young people pass through a zone of critical decisions when they learn about themselves, their strengths, their weaknesses, they learn how to make choices, they reach decisions, and they then, I mean, they use the phrase, accept the implications of those decisions, but that, that's having <coughs> decided that's what you're gonna do is how you're gonna get there and how you're gonna succeed when you get there. And it was at this stage that people started to introduce the idea of progression in career learning, to say that there are actually two phases to careers education. There's an exploration phase, where you're widening people's horizons as to what's out there, what the possibilities are. And then the convergent phase where you then focus on, and so what's the right choice for you? And as uh, my friend, um, the late Bill Law used to say, that's not a, something that we've appropriately addressed even yet. He would say that one of the problems with careers work with young people in schools is that we ask people to make a choice, his phrase, make a choice before they've got enough to go on. They haven't done enough exploration of what's out there before we suddenly say to them, right, what are you going to do at 16? So what would be a good choice of subjects to do in Key Stage 4? Well, hang on, I don't know enough about what's out there and what I could do and what the possibilities are. So I think that thought that actually, look at that, that's 50 years ago, that idea of an exploration phase before we then focus on the decisions is an important thing to bear in mind. 70s, big growth of careers education, as I've said. There was a major um, government-funded project on this, the Schools Council project. Um, this, I only refer to this because it actually raises a question which I think is still there. And the question is this, what's the purpose of careers education? And the Schools Council team in the 70s were split on this. Half the group thought that what careers education is about is helping people understand who they are, what the choices are that are out there, and how they make and how they decide what's right for them. The other half wanted to go further, a more radical, progressive approach, which was to say we shouldn't just help people understand the structures as they are now. They are going to be active, participating citizens, members of society, and we should help them understand how they can influence those occupational roles and influence the, stru the opportunity structure in society. Now, the team eventually came to a compromise that focused mainly on the, the first definition because they thought the other one was too radical and that there was a sense that they might actually, the government funding might stop at that point. But it's, it leaves behind for us still today, I invite you to think about, what's the purpose of careers education? Is it, those three things at the bottom, is it helping young people make a choice about what's available? So our job is to say, look, I'm going to give you as many experiences and encounters with employers, further education, higher education, apprenticeships, so that you can make a choice about what's right for you. Or is it to go further and say, because these are all building on each other, is it further to go further and say, and you're going to be making these choices and decisions throughout life, because whatever you end up doing immediately when you leave school or college is not what you're going to end up doing. There are going to be further career choices to be made. So our job is not just to help you make that choice. It is to equip you for a lifelong career development, how to make career choices throughout life or do we want to go into this territory that half the school's council team wanted to go into which is actually we should be empowering young people to influence the opportunity structures that are there and not just accept what's there but how can we help shape those opportunity structures remove some of the barriers to progression that there are in some cases i think where we are now 50 years on is we're definitely around number one I think there's a growing acceptance that we have to, if all we do is help people make the right choice when they're with us and when they leave us, we've only done half their job. We do need to equip people for a lifelong career development. It's a very important life skill of making career choices and career transitions. And it, But I don't think we've got very far into number three, 
that helping people understand that actually those opportunity structures are shaped by society of which you're a member. And <coughs> what are your responsibilities? Um, what are your powers of influence beyond accepting what's out there? But I just leave you with that thought of what are the definitions? What is this work all about? We're certainly around one. We've moved strongly into two. There's a question mark whether we move into three. Towards the end of the 70s, we got that well-known definition of careers work and framework that still stands the test of time. Um, the so-called DOTS analysis, the DOTS model that came that Bill Law, who I already mentioned, and his colleague Tony Watts in NYSEC, one of their first bits of work, came up with this framework for defining the aims and objectives of the careers education program. It is to help people become aware of themselves, to become aware of the opportunities available, to learn how to make a choice matching themselves to those opportunities and to learn how to make a successful transition to get there and to succeed when you're there. And that model actually is still the basis of almost any framework that you see today in careers education, because sometimes in education, we get things right. They stand the test of time and that DOTS model still works today. Now I'd like to come back to frameworks and learning outcomes in a moment, but I just want to make an important diversion at this stage because the book that Tony and Bill published the DOTS analysis in Schools, Careers and Community 1977 had another framework in it. It's got known as, and it's probably one of the most cited references there is in our field, for the DOTS analysis, but it also had within it another framework. And this was a framework of development of careers work in schools. Um, and they put forward <coughs> the idea that careers work grows and develops in schools over time. So initially in the 60s and in, even in the 70s, it started with the provision of careers information. So probably hanging around the school somewhere was a cardboard box full of leaflets that had been sent by various careers publishers of career occupation information. And one day somebody might have had the bright idea of let's get these leaflets out of the cardboard box and display them in a means that is accessible to pupils. And so that was the beginning of a careers library. And then one day a pupil came into the careers library and picked up one of these leaflets and asked the teacher who was in the room, who'd been given responsibility for careers at the time, some questions about it. And that was the first careers interview. Alongside this, we had the external agency which had been set up around this time in the 70s, that's when careers services were set up. And we had formal programs of careers, information, advice and guidance. And so Tony and Bill talked about setting up interviews where a young person may say, I want to go into this, how do I go about it? And we would offer them some advice on how they go about it. Or they might say, actually, I've got no idea what I want to do. And I've, I've got to reach a decision um, because the school's going to make me redundant in, in a short while. I'm going to leave. Um, and so we got into career counselling. The third element they suggested was the curricular element, which is actually some of this stuff we could do more efficiently in group settings. So that's what I talked about before those earlier versions of careers education were occupational sessions, uh, a session, group sessions giving occupation information. And it was only after that they said, actually, we can foster your self-awareness. We can help you become more occupationally aware. We can teach you decision-making skills. We can teach you application skills and prepare for transition. So we had the more formal input of careers education in the curriculum. And then their fourth stage of development over time is that schools would then move into thinking, well, how do we link this careers program with other curriculum activities? So we've got our careers education, and our careers lessons, but actually that links in with some of the other subject work. So how do we develop a careers element to some of our other subject curriculum? And how do we use the resources in the community, employers, colleges, universities, to contribute to our careers program and link that careers program to the resources in the wider community? Now that framework was set out in 1977. 
eight stages or four stages, each with their sub-stages of the development of careers work over time. What I'm going to invite you now to do is to look at another eight element framework that is presented in terms of what a careers education and guidance program should look like. And you'll be familiar with this one because it's the one that was published in 2014 and drives all of our work now, the Gatsby benchmarks. And what <coughs> interests me is the language is different. It's published 37 years later. It's not talking about the development over time. It's talking about what now that we have got a complete program, what are all the components? But what I find interesting, remarkable in it, is the correlation between this framework and that one. Because there's benchmark two in number one, providing information of work and study options. There's benchmarks three and eight in number two, giving personal career guidance and addressing the needs of each and every individual student. Number four, second part, there's benchmarks five, six and seven, linking careers programmes to employers, to workplace experiences, to bringing in people from further and higher education. And bench, and four, one, is benchmark four, linking the careers programme to <coughs> the subject curriculum. So the only bit where I don't see a correlation is in number three. I don't see an equivalent in the benchmarks of the distinct curriculum provision of careers education. So when I call this talk, is Gatsby great for careers education? I think Gatsby has been great and is great for careers, for career guidance in that sense of the overarching programme. And it's enabled us to do all sorts of developments and improvements over the last five or six years. What it's missing, I think, is that sense of where's the discrete curriculum provision that sits alongside all that important work that we do in the subject curriculum. Um, it's there, but I think it's only implicit in benchmark one where it talks about having a stable programme of career education and guidance, but it hasn't got an explicit bit that says alongside the work in other subjects, benchmark four, we need a discrete provision to deliver a fully comprehensive careers education programme. And that's the bit I want to explore with you. Now, that's why I made that tangential point, because about its relationship with the benchmarks, as both Rachel and Ryan said in their presentations, the benchmarks are very good at setting out the content, <coughs> but where's the overarching outcomes for the program? And <coughs> within those components, where is that discrete provision of careers education that sits alongside number four there, linking your subject teaching to careers? Let's continue our story of the brief history uh, because there's some lessons we can learn from this in the 1980s. We had lots of work in trying to implement all of these ideas that were developed in the 70s. There was a major curriculum development program called TVEI. Some of the older members of staff in your school might still remember that. It was a nationwide program throughout the 80s and into the 90s where schools were encouraged to participate, to develop their curriculum in a way that would make it relevant for an tech, increasingly technical um, era. And <coughs> It was a major curriculum program that had the development of lots of vocational elements in the, in the curriculum, but also underpinned by good quality careers, education and guidance. And that was a major theme of the TVI initiative. It worked through government funding, national funding that was uh, passported through to schools and colleges, through local consortia, through the local authorities. Schools worked in collaboration in consortia on the development project in a way that some of you might recognise as the way in which careers hubs are working now. 
We also had in the 80s a publication of a joint um, two government departments, employment department and the DFV or DES as it was then, published a, a seminal document working together for a better future, which was about saying we're not going to get anywhere with our careers education provision and guidance provision unless we work in partnership. Schools and colleges working in partnership with careers service, um, working in partnership with employers, working in partnership with other, and that, <coughs> the importance of partnership working was stressed at that time. Going to the 90s, we had a bit of a setback. Um, we had the introduction of a national curriculum and the focus then was back on <coughs> traditional school subjects. This initiative, the TBI initiative, was not led by the education department. Significantly, it was led by the employment department. And in a way, the national curriculum was a response to that and said, well, actually, the education department needs to get hold of the curriculum. And we want it to go back to a more traditional curriculum. And so we have that list of 10 school subjects. Um, and elements such as careers education were relegated to the position of being cross-curricular themes. They're delivered through the other subjects. And we lost that sense of having a tangible, discrete provision of careers education in the curriculum. Um, and it took 10 years from the introduction of the national curriculum and the list of 10, 11 or 12 subjects through to getting careers education recognised as part of the statutory curriculum. Uh, and that didn't happen until 1998 at the end of the century. In the meantime, and I'll make reference to them now because I'm going to come back to them, we had the development of quality awards. The first quality awards um, which will now recognise as the Quality and Career Standard, but the first quality awards, there were several individual ones, that, and the first one was developed in 1992. And this was a way of promoting the position of careers education in the curriculum, um, <clears throat> recognising um, a good quality careers provision. An important part of all quality awards was the careers education element in the curriculum. Okay, so 90s, slight setback, but we did reach a position that by the end of the century, careers education for the first time ever was part of the statutory curriculum, but only notice in the latter three years of compulsory education. At the turn of the century, I think that's when we reached the peak position for careers education in its brief history. We had a statutory duty to provide it, and that was extended down to seven and eight. So it wasn't, it, it didn't just stick at nine, 10, 11, it was extended down to seven and eight. So throughout the whole of secondary education, there was a requirement on schools to provide careers education. There was no national program of study like there was with the national curriculum subjects, but what there was instead, which I think was actually better, is a recommended set of learning outcomes. There was a published DEF document, a national framework of recommended learning outcomes, and they were recommended and they were a starting point, just like the CDI framework is now, a starting point to say, this is what's suggested, but you know your students, you know your locality, you'll know what your priorities need to be. But it's the starting point for designing a program, coming up with your learning outcomes. And that's the hardest part of curriculum design is being clear and explicit about what you want children to know, understand and be able to do as a result of your programme. And that's a recommended list, but you can adapt it. So it leaves you with the professional discretion to decide what's right for your students. It was all supported by a national support programme, the SEGNET website, with its materials there. And then there was local support through initially local authorities and grid services and then connections, including access to in-service training. So we had it all in place. We were doing fine until we got to the end of that decade and the beginning of the 2010s. And that you may remember is when the coalition government came in, when the Secretary of State for Education was Michael Gove, and one of his first actions was to close the connection service and move responsibilities for career guidance to individual schools and colleges. And as I acknowledged at the beginning of this talk, but none of the money with that responsibility. 
at the same time, and I have yet to find, and I've dug around in all sorts of places and talked to all sorts of people, I've yet to find what the rationale for this was. But he decided that that statutory duty to provide careers education should be removed. And that we are unique. We are the only area of the school curriculum in England ever to have previously been statutory and had that statutory status taken away. No other element of the curriculum that has been made statutory has then been taken away. For some reason, he decided that schools should no longer have to provide careers education and that set us back. And he closed the funding, uh, John referred in the introductory remarks to this conference about the austerity programme and one of the closures was the national support programme and that was cut completely. What was the impact of all of this? Well, the DfE's own research shows this, that five years later, or three years after implementation in 2012, so by 2015, one in three schools were not meeting their statutory duty to secure access to independent guidance. That's worrying. A third of pupils in the country were not getting independent guidance. And one in six schools, had dropped careers education from curriculum because they no longer had to provide it and so it was not seen as a priority and it was dropped. What we've been doing ever since is trying to retrieve the situation. So what we then get is the beginning of the recovery. So in the absence of a national framework, the professional body for this area said well we should continue to support careers leaders with a giving them a recommended framework. There is no statutory duty, there's therefore no national framework, but we should produce one. So ASEG, which eventually merged with the other careers organisations to form the CDI in 2013, developed a framework and that is still there today in its most recently updated version, the CDI's version of 2020. The quality awards continued and they developed further, they came together to form a single national award. So instead of having lots of, is this quality award the one I should go for, or should I go for that one, or should I go for this one? We have a single award now with the assessment criteria fully aligned to the benchmarks. And I think they go further than the benchmarks because they do talk about the importance of having a planned program of careers education. So that's an important part of our tools that we have available. We had the work that um, Derby did for Teach First in clarifying the roles that teachers have in careers education and that led to uh, the Teach First KELP program, the Careers and Employability Leaders program, which has actually helped inform the design of the careers leader training that we have now. Uh, we had the establishment of the Careers and Enterprise Company, which we now see as providing a lot of support for this area of the work. But actually, when it was first set up five years ago, the focus was on employer engagement. And as important as in employer engagement is, it's only one part of the provision. I mean, even the benchmarks make that clear. It's, it's benchmarks five and six, and there are eight benchmarks altogether. And then the big step forward came into the end of 2017 when we have the career strategy, when schools are expected to use the benchmarks, they're required to publish details, so that's an element of accountability, um, required to have a careers leader, the remit of the careers and enterprise companies extended beyond just supporting employer engagement. We have the thing that I've been banging on about for long enough, some training for this job, and we have the establishment of careers hubs which provide communities of support for people working together to develop their programs in line with the benchmarks. The model for careers hubs is based on the Gatsby pilot and schools working collaboratively and sharing practice. Um, I've said this before and some of you have heard me say it before, being the careers leader in a school you are one of the most highly networked people on the staff. I can't think of anybody else who has to work with almost every other member of staff to deliver their program and a whole load of external agencies. The nearest I can get to it is the SENCO. But in another sense, it's the lonely old job because you're the one person in the school who's interested in what you're doing. There is not another careers leader, there's not another member of the careers department I can talk to and say, how do you do this? What should we do about all of this? And what you want is opportunities to network and share practice. And We've got it's 
currently patchy about how that's provided. If you're a member of a MAT and they have the foresight to appoint somebody such as Ryan in, in that role of a system leader for careers across the MAT, you've got support through the MAT. If your local authority is held on to somebody supporting careers work in schools, you've got access to that. But otherwise, where do you go for support? And that's what I think the hubs have the potential to provide on a nationwide basis. At the moment, there's not full coverage, but we get in there. So we've got the beginning and the recovery. So th there's the history. Now I want to just talk about the current provision. The current provision then is that it's still too varied. In many schools, it is good. And actually, one of the weaknesses of the work that I've done for the last 20 years is I've spent too long talking to the converted, preaching to the converted. So I'm now talking to 60 odd people. And I suspect you've all got good careers programs who've got sufficient interest in this work to do something about it, to give up a day's work, to sign into this conference and pick up the pieces of everything you're supposed to be doing today, tomorrow. So I'm talking to the committed people um, and I won't recognise there is some good practice, but we've still got some provision that is not good enough. And we still now know that one in six schools have dropped in some curriculum altogether. So what can we do in terms of moving forward? We have this national focus now on improving career guidance. We've had it ever since the publication of the Gap Speed report and certainly since the career strategy. So let's ride on that. The benchmarks, people have talked about this being the Gatsby revolution. The benchmarks are, are now widely known. They are having a positive impact. The State of the Nation reports show that. We've got recognition of this role of careers leader and we have this nationally available, fully funded training. The careers hubs are there and I'm pleased to say that before the summer, they were only supporting 25% of the country. Now 50% of the country is covered. We need to get to 100% but we've got to improve it. And the careers sector itself, for example, I've talked already about how the CDI developed its framework, how the quality awards have come together as a single award. They're taking it. So we've got all sorts of things we can build on. Uh, my approach to life is always that my glass is half full, although when we get to the virtual bar, that might not be the case. But we got all these things to build on. But what's holding us back? Careers education is not part of the statutory curriculum. Uh, there was a missed opportunity for me when they developed the career strategy. Why didn't they say, let's reinstate careers education as part of the statutory curriculum? I know the reason why it would have taken legislation and there was no time for any legislation because the parliament was tied up with Brexit debates all the time. Um, the benchmarks, they do promote delivery of careers through other subjects, but they don't emphasize the need for a discrete provision alongside it. There's no official national framework of outcomes. The quality and career standard is there, but I don't see it being actively promoted either by the Careers and Enterprise Company or Gatsby. The hubs only cover half the country. There is no or very, very limited development funding available to schools. I'm not talking about the funding for personal guidance. That's another important issue. But um, one of the lessons that we learned from the Gatsby pilot is people really welcome that collaboration working together in the way as they did in the TBI days. But they also had a bit of pump priming money to help them few thousand pounds to help this development work and none, very little of that is available to schools across the country even those that are part of hubs and I still I'm sad to say that I think it's getting better but some of the key strategic players are not working together enough I still think there could be more collaboration between those key players of Gatsby the careers and enterprise company the CDI working truly collaboratively together as a team effort on this on this strategy um, can I just emphasise why I think the discrete bit is important? Um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this in various versions over the years. Uh, there are basically six models for how you deliver careers education in the curriculum. Separate careers lessons. Very few schools have got time for that these days. The only place I see that really is in special schools. Modules of careers in a PSHE carousel. Um, 
quite effective in that the careers person takes the careers modules, but sometimes they're inappropriately timed. Um, if you're in the last group to get your careers, you might find that the college application date has passed. Uh, the worst case I came across was preparation for work experience after they've been. So we need to find another model. Some schools deliver it through tutorial programs. That's great if your tutorial program is taken seriously by all tutors. That's hard work to achieve. Um, Ofsted evidence shows us that the most effective model for the discrete provision is to have an integrated PSHE course, of which careers is part. The course is taken by a group of teachers who are committed to teaching PSHE and the careers bit happens at the right time of the year. Supported by drop down days, when you can do all sorts of things that you can't do in a 50 minute lesson and work in other subjects. So it's not one of these models. The model is for delivery, effective delivery, is one of the first four, some discrete provision, supported by drop down days and cross curricular. So benchmark four is there and it's a really important part of it. And the stuff that Rachel shared this morning was really good, but it needs to be complemented by discrete provision for two th reasons. One, to deliver the parts of careers education that won't naturally fit into a subject context. And two, importantly, to pull together the cross-curricular elements for the young people. So I'm going to finish with my strategy for improving careers education in schools. And this is what I presented in Derby in December, and I've updated it 10 months on because I think we are starting to see progress in some of the areas. We're still awaiting the FE white paper, which is supposed to have in it the phase two career strategy. So we've still got the opportunity for some of these elements to be integrated into a phase two career strategy. Because I don't think we should get rid of anything that we've been doing since December 2017. Um, it's all good stuff. Let's now make sure that we pay appropriate attention to careers education. So I would still keep on the table the need to reinstate this statutory duty, but I would go further and I would go like Wales has done and extended the statutory duty to the end of, of compulsory participation in learning to age 18. I would amend benchmark four so it is very clear that it is cross curricular delivery through other subjects and discrete provision. I think we do need a new framework and you've heard already that the CDI has commissioned Tristram Hooley and there's a project underway now to develop an updated framework for career learning. I think it's really important we do that and that that framework is then subsequently used and promoted by all the key agencies working together. We need to extend the support available to schools across the whole country, the hubs, not just 50% of the country. We need to continue uh, the careers leader training and there are 650 places available this year and uh, there are talks about a further extension for another three years which is all good stuff. Um, the stuff in red here on deep red is the uh, updates. Um, I think there's still some further work we could do. Um, we would need to encourage all providers of initial teacher training to introduce to all secondary school teachers could argue also all primary teachers as well, an introduction to what career guidance is about. I think all schools should include career guidance in their CPD programmes for teachers joining the school. We need to promote the quality and career standard as an external validation of achieving all the eight benchmarks, including having a careers education programme. I do think we need to make development funding available to schools. Uh, the Gatsby pilot showed us with a small investment, modest investment, you can get a major areas of development. And I would link that to achieving the quality and career standard. What I would say is, because this would make sure that it's spent on careers and not spent on something else. Because if you just do, give schools development money, you, you need some commitment of, of monitoring how it's spent. So I'd say, yeah, you can have 50% of the money up front if you commit to, i.e. a written commitment from the Chair of Governments that you're going to work to the quality and career standard and you can have the other 50% when you achieve that standard. And you won't achieve that standard unless you've got good careers education. That's the logic of that approach. And I would go further and say all schools should be required to publish whether or not they've got the quality and career standard. Um, the new framework 
uh, I think it still needs to build on those elements that were in the dots analysis. I think we do need to recognise that we live in a digital age that we didn't in 1977 and digital career management schools need to be in there. I've got a slight gap between then I come to two other areas. Um, employability skills currently feature in the framework. Um, whether they appear in that framework or there's now future skills uh, or skills builder that's out there, doesn't really matter as long as employability skills are there somewhere. Um, but just a passing thought, but I think it's an important thought. You do need career management skills because you need on a lifelong basis because you've got career decisions and transitions to make. You do need employability skills because when you've got a job, you want to keep it. And that's what employability skills are. But let's remember now, rather than what was the position was 50 years ago, even 30 odd years ago, when I was a careers leader in school, most of my young people left and got a job. A significant minority stayed in our sixth form and some went off to the college because I was impartial, but most went into work. Now, nobody goes into work at 16 because we've raised the participation age to 18. And of those who leave school at 18, up to 50% go into higher education. So actually they do need their employability skills, but not till later. What they need is independent learning skills. And that for me is an important transition skill. Can you cope with independent learning at a university, at a college, on an apprenticeship? So if they're not in the framework, we're gonna make sure they are there somewhere in, if we're gonna equip people for lifelong career development. So my final thought is that's what those are practical steps that I said I would conclude with that we could take to improve the position of careers education. I do think we need a longer um, debate about what the whole place of careers education is in the school curriculum for the 21st century. Um, there has been this ongoing debate about is the curriculum just about cultural transmission where one generation passes on to the next, the sum total of its knowledge and theories and understandings? Or should it have an anticipatory value as well, which is, and um, we're also going to equip you for adult and working life. And that was the debate that Jim Callahan started and led to the TBI initiative. Because I think we do need a curriculum that has all this subject content National curriculum is very much embedded in a cultural transmission view of education, but alongside it, we should pay equal attention to some of those key competencies you need to be an economically active and responsible citizen. And careers education has got a key part to play in there. And it should, in my view, be a key part of the curriculum, part of its core, not something that's forever struggling to get recognition from the margins of the curriculum. Thank you for listening. I hope it's been helpful to you. If you want to find out more, um, I'll do a quick plug. Um, there's the second edition of the book. Um, I noticed earlier that Ryan had it on his, on his window cell. Uh, he called that his product placement. Um, I'm, uh, it's attached to the many offers that are at the back of your conference pack is I'm offering a discount for anybody who wants a copy of um, to read about all of this in further detail, uh, there's a copy there. Um, and also, if you wanted, if you haven't already got a copy of the Careers Leader Handbook that Tristram Hooley and myself put together um, a couple of years ago, um, that's available as well. But that's enough of the plug. Um, I hope that's been helpful. I'm happy to respond to any questions in the chat, um, and uh, I'm going to be around at the end of the conference um, if anybody wants to talk more informally about these things. Thanks for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. As ever, you know, that unique, that, that the unique ability you've got to be able to take us through all the important things that have been before that are in place that are missing um, and what we need for the future, but in layman's terms that we can all understand and, and, and find difficult to, to make an argument again. So thank you very much for that.